Okay, this time we'll ask our clerk to call the roll for a quorum, please. Commissioner Whitmore? Present. Commissioner Askew? Here. Chairman Whitfield? Here. Commissioner Hart? Here. Commissioner Stoltz? Present. All right, thank you. Everyone's in attendance tonight. Uh, we do have the agenda that was prepared and sent out a week ago today on our website through our social media. Uh, we did not get everything accomplished we'd hoped to, so it would be my recommendation to the board that under unfinished business, the resolution R20-22 to revise the public safety fee assessment in the, uh, in the county fire and rescue district, that uh, we remove that from this agenda at this time to give us more time to work on that and come up with a viable solution. So uh, other than that, that's the only modifications that I would have for the agenda tonight. Is there any others? Okay, so at this time, do we have a motion to approve the agenda and also by uh, removing the unfinished business? Motion to approve. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Blakemore to do so. Do we have a second? Second. I have a second by Commissioner Stoltz. Any further discussion of the board on the agenda? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the agenda is approved with the modification. Okay, we do have in the packet the um, uh, minutes from our regular scheduled meeting back on April the 14th. So those are in the packet for everyone's mm -hmm. review or anyone at home tonight watching on Facebook and pull those up off of the website. So at this time, we'll entertain a motion by the board to approve these minutes or if there's any corrections that need to be made. No motion to approve the minutes. Right, we have a motion by Commissioner Hart to approve the minutes. Do we have a second? Second. I have a second by Commissioner mm -hmm. Askew. Any further discussion of the board on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as presented. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we have informational, some discussion on a special event insurance for events at, the, at any county-owned community center. So we've asked our attorney, David Gottlieb, to come up and give us a brief overview about this information item. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, as you're aware, uh, the county has several community centers and frequently rents those out for various types of events. Uh, I bring to your attention tonight something that a lot of people aren't aware of and something this is just informational purposes for you to consider if you want to do it or not do it but uh, when someone uh, rents our uh, facilities um, we have to always be aware that an unexpected injury may occur on our premises and if it does occur on our premises that there is liability uh, potentially for that and so there is a mechanism that is available called special event insurance that can be acquired by anyone who rents our facility and uh, most insurance agents sell this type and of course it depends upon the nature of the event the duration of the event but it can be purchased for one day uh, or over a weekend and it would just provide coverage for the county if a claim was ever made against the county saying for example someone slipped and fell and claimed that the premises there was some defect in the premises uh, a missing piece of tile or something and that that's what caused the entry now this would be beneficial not only to the county but would also be beneficial to the person who uh, is sponsoring the event. And uh, so I just bring that to your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, my recommendation would be that is not something uh, that is covered under our uh, existing insurance uh, policy. And, uh, you know, if you were to uh, uh, ask that that become uh, a condition of running, then I would suggest that that cost be uh, borne by uh, the, um, the sponsor of the event. So do you all have any questions that I can answer? This is just 
informational at this point. So you're saying we don't have any <coughs> insurance in place for that now? Well, we do have some premise liability, but um, you know, I'm not sure if it is a special event for which we are, uh, whether we're actually being compensated or not from a rental perspective. Uh, you know, and I, I just don't want us to be out there. And candidly, I don't want the person who is sponsoring the event to be out there either for their personal protection uh, without insurance coverage. Do we, do we currently, in renting a facility, do we have a, some type of a hold harmless or some type of something that we make them sign? to relieve us of liability. I'm just curious because like, like our, let's just say the civic centers or that campus, for instance, which is a daily use, you know, during the week, you know, somebody can slip or fall there just as well, it, you know, whether they're out walking the track, you know, or whatever. <coughs> so I'm just curious, I, I think a great point, and I want to make sure that we do cover the citizens in the county for sure. I want to be careful about pricing it out of uh, the, the means of people that would use it for a birthday party or things like that, you know, so I'm kind of curious to, it, it, do we, is there a way that we might can look at covering that liability standpoint from, from having a release of some sort that's legal binding document that would be signed upon that would, that would maybe take the place of, or I know it's not going to completely cover, but I'm just curious how that might work. Sure, great point. Um, with regard to the Civic Center, we do have a standard lease, and uh, it does include uh, an indemnification and release uh, provision. And for some folks who are citizens who may not be familiar with that terminology, uh, a release just says that the sponsor releases, in this case, Walker County, from any claims that may be made in regard to, for example, um, uh, an event. A birthday party let's just say that and the term indemnification means that it goes a step further and it says not only I the sponsor release Walker County from any liability but I also agree to indemnify which means to make the county whole for any claims that are made against the county uh, for injuries or damages arising out of my use of your premises the problem is that uh, an indemnification agreement is only as strong as the financial resources of the person who signs the document. So I'm not trying to be smart about it, but let's say that somebody, um, I'm going to use the birthday party just as an example, and there's 20 young children, and children tend to be rather rambunctious and happy, and they might collide into each other or run into something. And if they were to have, for example, so hit, hit their head, um, God forbid, I mean, even if there isn't substantial uh, injury, which certainly we, we hope that would never be the case, but just taking a ride in an ambulance and going to the emergency room these days and having some MRIs, diagnostic type of tests done, can run into several thousands of dollars. And if the person who is running it uh, says, hey man, I, I don't have the money to do that. The person who's injured, if they think that it's as a result of the person who sponsored the event or the county, they're, they're going to look to the next party who can afford to reimburse uh, them for their expenses. So yes, the short answer to your question is with regard to the Civic Center, we do have that in our lease agreement. Um, with regard to the community centers, I have actually not seen uh, a lease agreement. Each of those, uh, I think that we need to have a standard agreement with that provision. I know that in the past, um, the community centers seem to have been sort of run by a person or two who may sort of be in charge. I mean, they're obviously they're county-owned facilities. But from a practical standpoint, there's usually a couple people at every one of them that are sort of the person in charge. So um, I, I plan on, um, you know, preparing a lease agreement and including in the lease agreement 
um, the, uh, uh, those provisions. However, um, you know, it's something, something for your thought. Sure, great mm -hmm. information. Great. So add a little bit to this. One of the things that caused this question to surface uh, is with one of our community centers, there had been an inquiry where a local person who had a, um, I guess, a nonprofit status, I'm, I'm understanding, wanted to lease one of the community centers for a summer day camp for children to come multiple days during the week for a summer camp. And they were asking, what's the requirements? What's you know, they were reaching out, asking these type of questions, you know, what do I need to provide to do this? And so historically, in Walker County, our community centers have all operated very well by people locally in the community overseeing those and, and taking pride and, and, and ownership in their community. And each one of them kind of operate a little differently based off of the people within the community. And they take those rental revenues and they put it back into that community center and they're buying their paper products and their soap and things like that for the bathrooms and the county maintains the facilities, the grounds, the big picture, electricity, all the utilities and all that go along with that and so then they can use the funding for special, special things over and above and so we don't have a standardized platform for each one of our community centers to, to work from that's been put together by the county attorney. And then also too, you could have events where you have large gatherings where it's a covered dish or a wild game or something and maybe you have a situation where you may end up with a food poison situation where you may end up with 15 or 20 people that go to the hospital and they find out they just got food poison, they're gonna be okay but you've got that type of situation. And so if we're looking at it, you know, nobody wants any of those bad things to happen. But if, if we have some type of minimum required type policy for, if nothing else, larger type of events or where there's a lot of gathering or food being brought in that's not prepackaged, then it could keep from having a hardship on that sponsor or that organizer uh, or the facilitator of the event and them come up and have 10 or 15 people that's got a doctor's visit for potential food poisoning. So it's just really to cover everybody and so we just wanted to bring it up in just general discussion and, and see because it would be kind of taking a different approach where the community centers up to this point have all kind of kind of had their own guidelines and things and this would be saying hey here's something we want a uniform across the county for consistency from a liability standpoint say that, that could be something we need to look at and and and, and just it, it, real quick on when you mentioned that someone like an approach or looking at maybe wanting to uh, lease or rent for an extended period of time like for a day, daycare or stuff like, like that. Like a day, a gate day camp. Day camp, just okay, like a day. week or something. Yeah, you know, like because I, my thought was is we just have to be very careful about doing tying tying up one of our uh, facilities for any length of time that would, uh, you know, uh, interfere with other citizens being able to use the facility yeah. as well. You know, we and it would still sure be at the up. discretion of the leadership of the local center if they wanted to do that. But if they did decide, hey, yeah, you know, nobody's using it. Monday through Friday from 8 o'clock in the morning till 2 and the kids want to come in and have a day camp and finger paint and that type of stuff and play basketball and someone's going to charge also a fee a lot of times for that, then there needs to be a uniform system. But this would be taking a step in a direction I don't think the county's been in before by trying to have a uniform requirement. And, and again, it's nothing negative on anybody's part. This question come forward as a citizen inquiring, just wanting to do the right thing and make sure they met the requirements. And so it generated the conversation. Good, very good information. Be something to think about for sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. At this time is uh, where we have on our agenda for public comments where we ask any of our citizens that want to come up to the podium and uh, we'll give you up to five minutes to come up and uh, address the board. 
Uh, we do ask you just to use your time wisely because there's only five minutes allotted each person. And we request that you uh, keep your comments or questions related to county government because we can't fix things in Washington or at the state level. So uh, try to talk to us about things <coughs> maybe we can, can help you with or have an impact on. So does anybody like to come up tonight and speak before the board? Yes, sir. If you would just come up to the podium there and uh, just state your name for the record, if you would. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is James Burton. I'm a local farmer. I raise beef cattle and hay for a living. Um, I've got a farm I've been having taken care of probably 20 years. I've been up cleaning it up where I can grow horse quality hay. It's 150 acres of this land. Um, the past few years, I've had my neighbor's cattle come into my property and eat my hay. It's in the winter time, it's in the springtime, it's in the summertime, it's every time. Deputy sheriffs tell me I have to make records and blah, blah, blah. Tell me I need to, I've started doing this. The 12th and the 22nd, I contact the owner, told him your cows are on my property, I need them off of it and quit driving through my hay field. Stay out of my hay fields. When he comes to get his cattle, he drives through my hay fields. It doesn't matter if it's raining, if it's frozen, it doesn't matter when he wants to ride across the hay field to run his cows back. I'm tired of it, finish. Call the shirt park the next day, the cows are out again. They tell me it's a silver case. I need to call the animal control, call the animal control. Kind of ignore me for a little while. They finally come out on the 31st. We had the owner of the cattle, the super, one of the uh, uh, two of the animal control guys, and I told him what I was going to do. These cows come back on my property. I'm going to load them up. I'm going to take them to the sale. I'm going to put them in the owner's name, and I'm going to charge them a haul bill, whatever it costs to catch these cattle, because I'm tired of it. The animal control tells me this is a civil suit. They can't get involved. If the cows are out on the highway, they can get about. The cows are always out on the highway. They're in my field, they're on the highway, they're everywhere. I think I come and talk to Mr. Uh, Gottlieb a little bit after that. I talked to them. Same morning I got done talking to you, there were five cows already in my hay field again. Call animal control. They tell me, I gotta wait to the supervisor before I can do anything. Next day, cows are out again. Next day's out again. I hired a gentleman to come in and tranquilize these cattle. I loaded them on the trailer and took them back to my facility where they wouldn't get run over. This property I got, they have wedding, they have parties, they have rugby, they have a lot of things going on. They don't want these cows on this property either. That's the reason I'm leasing this property where I can have good quality hay. Okay, so... And so the, that was on a Sunday. We loaded the cows up. Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I called animal control. They sent a supervisor or two or the animal control officer come out and took pictures. Said they was going to notify and write him a ticket. And they would get back with me. Never heard anything until that Friday. That Friday, I was called a detective from the sheriff's department. Asked me if I had any cattle, and I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, I said, how did you get involved? He said, well, they were turning and stolen. I said, well, animal control knows where they were at Monday morning. The land, the, the owner of the cattle knows where they were going to be because I told them I was going to retrieve them, get them out of my pasture. So they tell me I would have to go to court when he gets his citation I would have my day in court, okay? Talk to the supervisor, I talked to the detective, and I talked to the animal control guy. They all come out on a Tuesday, and they all put it on, I put it on a video. And they all said I'd have my day in court. It may take a while because the COVID's going on, okay? I waited a year and two months. Find out, go to the magistrate's office. The rain was on. Seventh and the fifth. I never was summoned. This position was on the ninth and the thirteenth of the twenty-first. 
paid a $300 fine. They spent five, $900 on having these cattle loaded up and moved to my place. And I give him these cattle back. It cost me 900 bucks. He walked away with $300 fine. And guess what? We started all over again this like past three weeks, cattle being in my field again. <clears throat> I turn in another official report on Tuesday, and they're supposed to be fining him. They're supposed to get to go back to court whenever. I hope I get to go to court. I didn't get to go last time, so it's been settled. I lost my $900, but I still got cows in my hay field. I want to stand and try to do something. I'm tired of it. Uh, we've got two instances. One is your current situation, and one is the previous situation. And so I'd like to focus uh, first on the current situation, and then I'll be happy to address the previous situation. Okay? Um, with regard to the current situation, uh, Officer Stiles is here today. I have had uh, a communication with him this week, and I believe uh, that he is investigating that. Have any citations been issued yet? Yes, sir. I issued a citation to the county. Okay. I spoke to Mr. Burton and the uh, owner of the county. Okay. So, just to give you a timeline, if it happens before the 15th of the month, which it has, uh, the defendant will be cited by the court to appear the first Monday of June. Okay, that's called arraignment. At arraignment, he enters a guilty or a not guilty plea. Um, usually, in cases when somebody enters a guilty plea and it's their first offense, the court has, uh, in the past, uh, permitted them to pay the fine. However, if there is a repeat offense, and this is arguably a repeat offense, I know no more than what you told me today about what happened this past week, then um, we will, and I'll, I'll go ahead and inform you, it'll be the first Tuesday in May, and it'll be right here. June, 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 June. Well, I'll be summoned, is my question. No, you won't be summoned so, for arraignment. You'll be summoned if you, usually you aren't summoned, period, but, you, but I'm giving you the dates now so you know when they are. So the trial would be the first Monday in July. Uh, the arraignment would be the first Monday in June. Uh, I would encourage you to attend both of those because I never, I, I am not the judge and I don't have the authority what to do and not to do. However, if I know that uh, a, a person who is um, uh, bringing a complaint, uh, I will uh, you know, encourage you to attend, and the judge will probably let you uh, speak at the arraignment and then make a decision whether or not to accept the guilty plea. Now, any action that you take uh, with regard to capturing someone else's animals, tranquilizing them, loading them up and selling them. We, we uh, the county takes no position at all. That is a uh, matter uh, that you're involved in and uh, that would be between you and the owner of the uh, cattle, okay? If uh, you always have the right to bring a civil action, and a civil action is different than a citation that's been issued uh, by the county. County citation is a criminal matter. But irregardless of what criminal uh, citation is, you always have the right to pursue a separate civil action uh, in any of our court systems, magistrate, state, or superior court, and uh, pursue restitution. Uh, you can certainly come to uh, uh, in the first uh, Monday in, uh, in June and you know, plead, uh, explain to the court your position. And the judge is within her discretion whether or not to order restitution. Typically, restitution is more in a civil case where you bring the action and the judge in a civil case makes the decision uh, about whether to order uh, 
payment or not. So I hope that that has been somewhat helpful. Uh, I will be more than happy uh, to meet with you uh, either after the meeting this evening or you can stop by my office or you can call me in the morning and I can give you uh, more details. But I did want to sort of give you a, a basis and also to sort of explain to the public as well. It's just a good informational time to sort of say this is how animal control issues work. In, in our ordinance, we do have a animal running at large, which means an animal that has, is not being confined on their property and or someone else's property. Usually, we're talking about domesticated animals, such as dogs, that's 90% of it. But livestock certainly is an animal, and if it runs loose, our, our biggest concern is when animals get out on the road, because we don't want the motoring public to be injured by anybody's cow out there that somebody is, it can be as serious as death if you hit one. Excuse me. The problem I had that I had three officials tell me I had my court date and they would let me know and I never got it. That's my problem. Okay. Well, if you would like to talk to me, I can look forward with you on the situation. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Anyone else like to come speak tonight? Yes, sir. Come on up, please. I'm Alfred Holland, I'm Chickamauga. I was here a couple of months ago about a water problem on on Myers Road on the east end. Mr. Byers, he knows about it, but what they're doing, it, it comes in like a 48 tile, and when it gets to the end, that's where it flows. It's got two small, like maybe 18 inch tiles there, and, and it, Mr. Byers told me here a while back about putting another tile, but that won't help it. Because what the small tiles, all that brush, it comes a couple of miles down, you know, down through there, and the brush gets in them small tiles and stops them up. And since I've been here, we've had a couple of floods, and, uh, and it's it just, it's just real bad, you know. But the reason I come here today is because if we don't get it this summer, this winter, there's going to be something more important than mine. So you know what I'm saying, and uh, that's the last time. That's what Mr. Byers said it. Uh, he has more important things up on Nick Jack up there. And, uh, but uh, unless it's a four foot, 48 inch tile in there, it won't ever work because the small ones, the brush comes a couple of miles down through there and they'll get in that small one and stop them up. Now you could have three or four tile there, but they'd still be stopped up. You'd need one large cooker, you know, 48 inches. And uh, this has been going on for a long time, but uh, I'm gonna keep coming until I get it fixed. <laughs> Hopefully anyway. Carl, are you familiar with this situation? I am. That's in the in the corner of the interstate section there of Vitato and Myers. Is that the corner of Vitato and Myers? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right there, there. We can't really go any bigger because there's not enough coverage there. We'd have to go. I don't know how many feet to the left and right to dig all those ditches out uh, to get a 48. 48 would never work. I think there's two 18s or two 24s. Yes, two 18s, sir. That's, and there's probably maybe eight inches coverage over those two pipes, and that's pretty flat, low area road, and it's flooded <coughs> forever. I, I, it, it's in a hole. I don't know how else to get it out. If we put anything bigger there, then we'd have to ramp up the road, which is going to create a pond. Or, or, or either, I, and I just, I want to ask you this too, Carl. Uh, of course, it, and it, it would be a, a totally different direction as far as the expense and work, but to broaden it out, we, we'd have to do something more like a box covered and go wider and, and get, 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 in other words, if you, you're not going to get a 48 inch height or even a squash pipe, you're not going to be able to get enough coverage, but to go wider and get more volume through without the obstruction of individual, you see what I'm saying? That, I'm just asking you, you know. Possibly do that. The ditches are pretty narrow anyway. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be something we could look at in a couple yeah. of different ways then. Yeah, we'd go look at it and get a couple ideas, but I can't really go any bigger because there's just not That's what I was, so that, that's the thing is you, there's just not, the, you know, the from right. the road elevation to the bottom of the ditch elevation, there's not, there's not four foot there hardly. It, yeah, it's that's probably right. three foot. That's the only way you could fix that is, I know you don't want to do that, but. 
take the road and go to the area of one. So that's kind of and what I'm talking down, about. You would have to open it up and, and, wi and, do, a, and do a wider you could dig down with then, a concrete right, yeah. box of some yeah. type. And, and, and some, yeah. I mean, no reason why you couldn't dig down deeper. And uh, I, I know yeah. that's better. If we dig down deeper, it's just, just to put a 48 in, then you're going to have a hole under the road. So when the water comes down, it's still <coughs> only going to it's only going to flow as deep as the ditch is around it. Well, you guys are pretty smart. I'm afraid you can figure that out some kind of way. We'll be glad to we'll keep on looking at it. Thanks a lot, Mr. Right. Shannon. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. You too, Mark. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Anyone else tonight? Yes, ma'am. Come up, please. <coughs> My name is Karen Bradley. Uh, I just wanted to update from what I brought in last month about the veterans, the Lady Veterans uh, Day. And uh, Christy has uh, made the official date, which is June 20th. It's going to be at 6 o'clock. And you can contact Christy Fowler at 706-996-4111. Yes. And it'll be at 6 o'clock. That'll be on a Monday. 20th. Yes. Thank you. I think it's going to be at post 339 there on Chattanooga Street. And it's for all ladies that's been in service. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. All right. Anyone else? Okay, we'll go to the next item on our agenda. Uh, under new business, our annual property assessment update from Terry Gilreath, our chief assessor. Chief appraiser, sorry. Chief appraiser, Terry Gill. Yeah, we do have a couple of assessors here with us uh, this evening. Buddy Chapman, our chairman, and, and Karen Deck, our newest member. Uh, I've got uh, Mr. Keith Fultz here to, for more support, but. Uh, it's that time of year again, and uh, we will be sending the notice of assessments out on the 17th of this month. So that's the next queue. They'll be in the mail then. We have, uh, of course, the, the appeal period is 45 days, and, and uh, July 1st will be the final day to, for, for appeal. Um, not been fun. I can tell you that. We've had a lot of... of, of uh, Sales, a lot of deed transactions had uh, pretty close to 4,000 deed transactions this this year, and so far we're on track for this next year to be about the same. It's uh, not stopping. It's not easing up. the uh, The values, of course, they they keep going up. Uh, the sales are uh, ridiculous. I can I can give you know. Um, there's places where, um, you know, a couple of years ago we had a house that sold for uh, $200,000. Last year it sold for 300000 This year it sold for 400000 So that, that sort of thing is common. And um, so we're having to constantly chase those numbers to keep those values up where they're supposed to be according to state law. So uh, there's going to be a difference, definitely a difference in the values this year. Um, the... Commission board last year, of course, uh, uh, did the right thing and lowered their millage rate to, uh, to accommodate that. And uh, I commend them for doing that. That was a good move. But, uh, the, of course, you've got the uh, Board of Education that, you know, they need to do the same thing and kind of relieve that a little bit. So, uh, but we had no choice because uh, our ratio studies were telling us to do that. And... Uh, uh, ratio studies are pretty complicated, but basically it's just, you know, the sale against the value that we have. The higher the sale, the lower the, uh, the uh, ratio study will be because uh, 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 that's how it's set up based off that 40%. But um, one thing that we have uh, been uh, doing, we've got some... Uh, uh, analysis group that's helping us uh, through this. We, we set our, our new values earlier in the year. We got the ratio 
up to 40 where it should be at. But then we've done another uh, ratio study at the end of the year, and that 40 has now dropped down to 38. So the, the values are, are really just constantly going up, and we don't see when it's going to end. You know, so uh, all we can do is just keep doing what we're supposed to do by law and keep uh, department audits and department revenue off of us. So, but uh, but it's that time of year, and we'll we have to do what we got to do. Board of Assessors doesn't want to raise values, but we had no choice because it's just overwhelming. It's truly overwhelming. Not just here. It's, it's all over the United States. It's all over the state of Georgia. It's everywhere. I've, I've talked to uh, people in Oregon, and they say the same thing. The, they're selling their properties for unbelievable amounts of money. They kind of have some of the same issues with uh, people pouring out of California to go to Oregon or come out this way. So uh, I do see a lot of that. But um, uh, also out uh, of Mississippi, we see a lot of folks out of Mississippi. I have no idea, but we've seen that for years. People coming out of Mississippi, um, Iowa, New Jersey, New York, you name it, they're coming here. Uh, but just to let everybody know that those, uh, those notices will be going out, and there are some changes. And uh, also, too, on that, we've already started working on next year's, trying to stay on top of them and keep those values where they need to be at. Um, we don't like doing it, but we, we have to do it. So, uh, question, sure. right ahead. Terry, well, just just ballparking. I mean, I don't know if this is a viable question. If there's action percentage-wise on, on on increases, what are you? If you were talking just a general across the board, how how, how are we looking? Okay, let me let me start with this. Everybody's property is different. Sure. And, and they have a, a different um, different value to them, different way of doing things, uh, different grade. They, have, they all have a different makeup, different um, acreage, and so forth. So some some go up a little bit, some go up a little bit more, some may not go up hardly at all. Um, overall, once we've got done, and we had to change our base values to begin with. That's what helped us to get up to to that 40%, that perfect spot. Right. And uh, we had to, to change those. But but overall, with doing that, in the entire county, it's right at 24%. So it doesn't mean, though, that every person's property went up 24%. And also- the overall, was the overall average is about 20, 25% increase? Yeah, it's 24.9 is what it, it, it come out to. Um, but like I say, it's, everybody's property is different. Some, some went up a little bit, some quite a bit, and depending on what they've done, you know, some we, we went out and found uh, uh, things they may have added to it that we didn't know about or things like that. The, the new, new property, new construction doesn't really have an influence on that because uh, they've not seen, uh, they've not uh, had that benefit of being in that previous value range. So. So they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't be affected like that. Uh, we do have, you know, quite a few, and of those, so which is a good thing. Um, but overall, that's just what it is everywhere. Everybody's going up like that. You know, went up, went up last year trying to chase it down a little bit. I think it went 16 percent last year, and uh, uh, that was nothing <laughs> compared to what the sales were doing. The sales are ungodly. Got a, a lot of people, um, and we've heard it. They, they're bidding on these properties, and and getting way above what the asking price is. You got you got bidders. You've got bidders paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to other bidders to get them to stop bidding on properties. So it's just, this is not like anything that we've ever seen before. It's just, uh, it's hard to keep up with that. You know, they, the banks, it's a little different this time because the banks are, uh, they're not loaning that kind of money. So if someone 
you know, gets that property, banks only going so far. They're, they're legally bound now after all had that disaster back in 2008, but people are putting money on top of it, and they've got money. And, and, and quite a bit of money on top of uh, what the asking prices are. We see it, see it all the time. And uh, an increase since January 1st of 2001 up to current, it, it, there's been a 26 percent increase in our market in the median value. Just the median value, that's everything, just the yeah. whole county. Since when, Keith? Since January of 2001. Oh, God. It's, uh, there's, there's no. The, here's the problem. There's no inventory out there hardly, and so the, the simple supply and demand. Right. The demand is still so great, and the supply is not there, so it's driven the prices up. Right. And people have actually, I've seen it several times where properties listed for two hundred thousand, it sells for two fifty. And uh, so I've heard because they get into those bidding wars. Yeah. Y'all see a lot of that. I've heard, I've heard it, but yeah. y'all see actually. And unfortunately, that. that's, if you get enough of that, that creates a market. And we have to do that because, you know, that's what state law charges us to do. Right. So it's, it's like Terry said, it's nothing that we want to do. Oh. It's just that, you know, the law requires us to do Keep us in compliance. Yeah, we have to be in compliance. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, the, the Department of Revenue reviews what we do. They keep up with us through the uh, Department of Audits and, and to make sure that we've got our numbers up there. If we don't have our numbers up there, of course, the county gets fined. If, you know, it's $5 a parcel, that seems like nothing, right? Well, now they've added teeth to all of this. They can act, actually strip the county of all their grants. And you're talking millions of dollars gone like that. If it's if the county doesn't cooperate and it gets so bad, they can take away the charter. The county would no longer exist. They they went that far, and uh, then the state will tell you what you're going to do. Hmm. And that's the last thing we want here. Hmm. We never want the state telling us how to value property, what we should be doing here. So, um, so we we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, but unfortunately. It's hard to chase it down because there's, you know, this, this same house I was telling you about sold three times. You know, it's hundred thousand dollars increase every year. When you have hundreds of them like that, it winds up affecting everybody else. So uh, it, it'd be one thing if we just had one or two, we'd just, just kick to them out. Give you an idea from January of this year to today. There's already been a 14% increase in the market. Five months, 14%. Um. Terry, you mentioned 4,000 deed transactions. Was that in 2021? 20, for the 2021 sales for the 2022 tax year. Okay. And we've, like I said, the, um, already blocked that for the 2023 tax year, this coming tax year. So we we did 81 deed books last year. You're looking at right around 50 on average per book. Then this year we're already uh, up to 25. So um, it's it's not easing up. And then the, and then when you, we get the PT61, which tells us you know the uh, the transfer, how much uh, they paid for it, and all of that. And, and sometimes man, it's just shocking. You just sit there and shake your head like, what are we going to do? You know, this has got to stop at some time. But there's just too many things going on with, number one, the inventory. The inventory is not there. The demand is so high because of situations like the uh, interest rates. Interest rates are so low. People we've been working with that they work out of, of some other counties too. He said he was, he's heard of them getting a 1.8% interest rate. So it's just unheard of. So uh, I know the feds talk, have, have raised it a little bit. That's nothing. That is absolutely nothing. That will not slow down anything. It, and you got, you know, of course, all these, the years, all this stuff starting to accumulate, this lack of inventory 
then you play in zoning restrictions. So zoning restrictions are starting to catch up because now you've got you know all these people coming in, but you're only limited in what you can do in certain areas. So th that sort of thing is catching up too, and it's causing a problem with the inventory. So uh, there's a lot of things going on out there if you just think about it. You know, people flooding the country, and now they're moving out here, and uh, it, uh, it's creating issues here. And if you didn't have zoning in place, then you could you'd be elbow to elbow, knee deep. Yeah, I mean, it's just a con. It's just, you know, it's one of those, you know, you're, you're only, you don't do so much. So. Yeah. The only, the only thing that would fix that sort of thing would have to be a, just a whole new way of thinking about zoning restrictions when it comes to that. You couldn't, you couldn't like change things in Marker County and the rest of the state not change along with it. It'd be disastrous. So, uh, <coughs> so uh, you'd, you'd need everybody in the United States to change the zoning way of doing things. You know, back in the day, it was just to restrict certain areas. You know, but, but now with, with growth over the years and people coming in, you know, the numbers going up as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, the amount of homes, now you're getting into where, oh, we can't build here. We can have to do this. So, so you've got that along with the uh, interest rates. So, so it's uh, putting a burden on the inventory here. Well, thank you for coming tonight and giving us an update. Okay. Appreciate it. Very informative. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is a resolution R21-22. Uh, this is a uh, our 401A program for our retirement program for our employees that are on the 401A. Uh, ACCG has amended the and restarted, or excuse me, restated the ACCG 401A defined contribution plan document and the accompanying document agreement to reflect changes in applicable law and has obtained uh, internal revenue service pre-approval for the amended and restated ACCG 401A defined contribution plan document adoption agreement utilizing the 2020 IRS pre-approved plan document for Walker County. Uh, these new documents reflect the same retirement plan design and benefit that were implemented effective October 1 of 2019. So our team members will see no changes to their 401A retirement benefit. This will just be to update the documents that are required by the Internal Revenue Service. So I'll read this uh, resolution. Unfortunately, it's a little bit lengthy. This was prepared for us for adopting of these agreements. A resolution to adopt and amend the restated ACCG 401A defined contribution plan for Walker County employees. Whereas Walker County, Georgia, the employer has previously adopted the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia ACCG 401A defined contribution plan for Walker County employees. The plan through the adoption agreement. Whereas ACCG has appointed a defined contribution Plan Program Board of Trustees, the DC Board pursuant to the ACCG Defined Contribution Plan Program Master Trust Agreement, the Master Trust Overseas Plan Administration Plan Documentation, and to select investment options for investments of the assets of the plan. Whereas ACCG has amended and restated the ACCG 401A Defined Contribution Plan document and the accompanying adopting agreement to reflect changes in applicable law and has obtained internal revenue IRS pre-approval for the amend, amended and restated ACCG 401A defined contribution plan and adoption agreement, the 2020 IRS pre-approved plan document, whereas the employer desires to amend and restate the plan by adopting the 2020 IRS pre-approval plan document, Whereas the employer desires to amend adoption agreement section 2.17, eligible employees exclude district commissioners in order to conform to the terms of the plan to applicable state law and the employer's past administrative practices. Whereas the employer desires to further amend the adoption agreement section 217, 
eligible employees to include employees of the tax commissioners hired before July 1, 2012 in order to conform the terms of the plan to the employer's past administrative practices. Now, therefore, at the meeting held, uh, which would be today, the Walker County Board of Commissioners hereby resolves as the following. Resolve that the Walker County Board of Commissioners hereby approves the adoption of the attached, amended, and restated ACCG 401A defined contribution plan for Walker County employees consisting of the ACCG basic plan document and the accompanying adopting agreement, which reflects the elections made by the employer under the provisions amended and restated plan. Further resolved that the provisions in section 6.02 of the former adoption agreement, which became effective October 1, 2019, which reads a participant vested percentage in the employer contribution uh, to service with the employer before October 1, 2019 shall not be less than the vesting percentage obtained by the participant as of September 30, 2019 under the applicable terms of, of the superseded plan in effect as of September 30, 2019 shall continue to apply and if included in the amendment and restated document. Further resolved that the effective date of the amended and restarted plan shall be January 1, 2022, except otherwise specified therein and provided that the above described changes concerning the eligibility of district commissioners and the eligibility of employees of the tax commissioner hired before July 1, 2012 shall apply ret retroactive to the date they were first implemented by the employer. Uh, further resolved, the commissioner chair is hereby authorized and empowered and directed to take all further actions and to execute all documents necessary to implement these, these resolutions. Further resolved that any resolution in conflict with this resolution is hereby repealed. Uh, this is for the Walker County Board of Commissioners signed by the chair. Again, they're doing this for every 401A plan that they administer in the state. I think this is a process they have to do like once every 10 years. Uh, the reason for the couple of uh, changes there. There was a state program for tax commissioners and tax commissioner employees that was a state program that was stopped back in 2012. But our tax commissioner and tax commissioner employees have, have been on our plan and so we had to make this modification so they did not get excluded because we want them to all continue to be on our plan. And then our enabling act specifies that the district commissioner's compensation does not in include the county paying for any type of benefits. Uh, the district commissioners can pay for benefits as additional expense of their own. But the 401A program is 100% county funded, no county employee puts money into this plan. So that's why those couple of modifications had to be made to make sure we still honor everything that we're currently doing. So there's quite a stack of documents here uh, that outlines the program. So this time, is there any questions of the board? No, sir. No, that was a lot. <laughs> All right, so do we have a motion to approve the resolution and the attached documents for the restatement um, of the 401A program? Yes, motion to approve. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Hart to accept the resolution and the attached documents. Do we have a second? Second. I have a second by Commissioner Stoltz. Any further discussion of the board? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed?
Okay, the next item we have is purchase order 2022-0001379 to Chase Reline, Inc. for $38,500 for Callan <coughs> Drive Storm Drain Rehabilitation to be funded out of the 2022 general funds. So I've asked our Public Works Supervisor, Carlin Bowers, to come up and give a brief overview of this project. Uh, this is about 210 feet of galvanized pipe that's washed out on Callan Drive. It rusted out. Uh, it's caused some of the yards that this runs through to sink. Some of the dirt and everything is kind of just running through the pipe. Um, chose to do the reline. There's two large catch basins that would be involved if we were to dig it all up. One concrete driveway. We'd have to close uh, Callan Drive, which is pretty heavily traveled, um, three or four days to try to get all of this worked in. Um, three utilities, sewer, water, and I'm pretty positive there's gas in that too. All of that, I, it would be in the middle of all of that dig. So um, relining it, they will, they're putting 20 inch HDPE pipe in it. I know it's a 24 inch pipe, but it's be smooth wall, so the flow rates will, just, will match up. Um, they're also going to, instead of completely rebuilding these catch basins, they're, they're while they've got their grout machines in there, they're, well, they'll redo the bottom and fix the walls, then pressure pump everything else in there to fill the void so there won't be any excavation needed. Um, any questions on that? You have used this county before? Yes, yeah. yes, they've done several of these and they're they're pretty good and pretty quick. And the okay. job should be about maybe three days, mm -hmm. three days tops. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're pretty We've good. We've had good it. success with this company yeah. and once Carlin made his assessment, he got some pricing. I met him out there and, and looked at this firsthand as well. and. It would be a major project going in and dig it all up. It would okay. cause a yeah. tremendous yeah. amount of inconvenience for those people in the subdivision because this is at the bottom mm -hmm. of the subdivision and then it, it inclines up. Uh, this is probably the most cost effective, most time efficient. I think we've had this company over the last couple of years maybe do about five other projects. One was down yeah. on West Cove Road on the south end and they did um, one. Overbrook. Uh, Overbrook Drive was one that and was very successful. We've done a 86 inch um, when we had the kind of the tornado south end of the Fed on Easter Sunday. Had an 86 inch pipe that went under our road and railroad track, on Dripping Springs Road, I think that was the dead end portion. Remember it? And anyhow, it is a big pipe. You drive a truck through it, and they done it in about maybe two weeks. But there was no way we could dig that one out. It, it was a good 80 feet on one side, 80 feet deep. So it worked out. They've done a, done a really good job, and it's taking everything it should and flowing good, and everything's held up. So, so I, I definitely concur with our superintendent's evaluation. This is the most the best way to fix this. Okay. When do you think the work will start? I talked to him. A little bit last week, I think he was gathering, just getting materials together. Um, I need, I'll call him, tell him this is approved if everything works out, and I, I need to get a timeline. They're, they got a lot of stuff going on. I know yeah. they're working on a couple for GDOT now, um, but I believe this is, they can get on it, should be able to get on it pretty quick. Any other questions for Mr. Carl? All right, hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the purchase order for Chase Free Line for $38,500? Motion to approve. I have a motion by Commissioner Blake Moore. Do we have a second? Second. And a second by Commissioner Askew. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, purchase order is approved. Thank you, Thank Mr. Carlin.
Okay, the next item we have is our uh, monthly departmental statistic data report. Uh, on our animal shelter, 86 dogs and 69 cats were brought into the shelter. We had uh, really good response this past month on adoptions, 13 adoptions of dogs and 18 cats. Uh, it's always great to report to return as many animals to the rightful owner as possible. There were 17 dogs that were returned to the rightful owner. Uh, code enforcement did 218 inspections, uh, had to write 30 citations. Our roadside trash team picked up 9,480 pounds of trash off the side of the road. Uh, our voters register uh, reported 205 uh, people registered new to vote in Walker County, so that brought our total up to 42,520 people uh, showed to be registered to vote in Walker County. Fire department, fortunately, uh, calls for services are down, which is always positive. 413 calls for service. They installed 19 smoke alarms, which is always a good, uh, good report. Anytime we get more smoke alarms out there to protect our families. Uh, Mountain Cove Farms was super, super busy in April with 167 nights of rentals in our cabin and house. That was up from 49 from the month of March. Uh, single family home construction, still, still very hot in Walker County. 12 new permits pulled, gets us at 58 for the year. Uh, we added uh, 72 additional followers to Facebook and added 40 new subscribers to our free e-newsletter. And our transit service had 2,262 uh, trips on our transit, and we know that's going to continue to increase due to our starting of offering transit on Saturdays starting uh, in the next couple of weeks. So those are just some of the highlights of the report. You can find that information on our website or in the agenda packet as well. Okay, at this time we do... Uh, have on our agenda for uh, commissioner comments, so we'll start with uh, Commissioner Blakemore. Appreciate everybody coming out. I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. Just call, text, or email. And I, if I don't answer, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you all for your support. Thank you for your getting getting out and coming and being a part of the process. I want to remind everybody that our uh, election's coming up. We've got uh, our early voting will end the 20th. Tomorrow or this Saturday will be our last Saturday uh, to early vote. I just like to to, to to convey to folks how important it is to get out, support your candidate, support your, your community because that's your right, and you need to do it. And need, we need to make sure we we participate in that. So it's coming down to the wire. So just be sure if you want to do it early, you got another week. Saturday is the last Saturday, and the early voting stops on the twentieth. Thank you. Okay. Good, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, that's, that's important, Mark. Glad you brought that up. Make sure you vote. Um, the Honeybee Festival in the Fed is a big event. They haven't had it the last couple of years because of COVID. they got a big event planned on June the 4th. So look it up. It should be a, they got a lot planned for that. It's going to be a great event. The other thing I want to mention, uh, we should have a new barbecue restaurant open on the west side of the Fed within a couple of weeks. Robert Warlaw's restaurant should be open. I'll talk to him another day. So lucky you. Lucky IQ. Lucky, IQ. Lucky IQ Barbecue. If you haven't had it before, it's going to be great. It's over there in the old Mars Theater District, so looking forward to that opening up. Robert? Yeah, making me hungry. Ah, uh, me too. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Certainly appreciate it. If I can be of any service, uh, call, text, email. I uh, want to thank all of our county employees who are here tonight. I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you for your service to the county. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the road department. I've talked to you guys multiple times this week, and so thanks for all you're doing, working hard, and greatly appreciate that. Thank y'all. Well, thank you. I wanted to uh, share with everyone tonight a letter that I got from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or better known as the EPA. And typically, when you get letters from the EPA, it's not good news. But uh, fortunately, this time, it's very good news, and so I wanted to read uh, this letter to you. Uh, I received this today from the EPA. It says, on behalf of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, I am pleased to congratulate you and confirm that Walker County was selected as one of the entries uh, EPA will begin negotiating to award a cooperative agreement for the assessment grant, Walker County submitted an outstanding application 
and we are deeply appreciative of the, tre the tremendous commitment of time and energy that went into the preparation. Since the inception of 1995, EPA Brownfields program has worked to help state and communities around the country to clean up, revitalize brownfield sites. We fully expect that these brownfield projects will provide benefit to the environment, economic, excuse me, and the economy of the local communities. Again, congratulations on being selected. We look forward to working with you. Uh, and speaking with the regional four representative, he actually called me today before he sent me this letter. Uh, he was the representative again from region four from the EPA. Uh, region four represents the state of Georgia, Kentucky, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and six tribes. They received 98 proposals for grant applications, 57 are receiving some level of funding, seven of those are in the state of Georgia, one including Walker County. And so this was a collaborative project in conjunction with uh, the city of Lafayette, city of Chickamauga, and the city of Rossville. I uh, want to give a shout out to Elizabeth Wells. She was a big part of this. She put a lot of time and energy and did a lot of heavy lifting on this, representing both the city of Rossville and the city of Lafette, both. Uh, this, uh, we've got a little more paperwork we have to do before we actually receive the official award, but uh, this is the, the pending documents that they send out to issue this award to issue an award to Walker County and the three accompanying cities of a half a million dollars to do brownfield assessments in our communities where we have sites like Coates America, uh, the Barwick facilities, and, and many others in our community that need to be cleaned up and revitalized and, and put back into the marketplace. And so this half a million dollar grant pays for the engineering work that needs to be done to do the site assessments to meet all of the federal guidelines. Once that is done and completed, then we will go in queue for funding for cleanup. And most of the cleanup projects are usually around a million dollars starting out per site is what it takes to clean up a lot of these sites where there's contaminations and pollutions. So once again, we've been very blessed in Walker County over the last several months of receiving grants. This is something that the team's been working on for uh, about two years. We applied last year as well, and we lost out by five points. We missed the mark by five points. And there was no one in Georgia got a grant last year. So we are one of seven in the entire state and one of 57 in the entire region out of 98 applications. So uh, hats off to the team and all of the folks in our cities and counties that took part in this. And now the work really begins. And so we look forward to uh, getting this off and running and we will have some uh, public hearings on this going forward, informational sessions, and also, this will allow for uh, property owners within our community uh, can, can submit their property to get the assessment as well that would be paid for out of this grant. So it may be something as small as, a, as a, maybe a former gas station or convenience store or, or any type of business or property that maybe has a past issue so we can work with big projects and small projects and invest these uh, grant dollars into getting the assessments and then everything that gets assessed will put in queue for funding for cleanup. So it can be uh, owned by a local government, it can be private property, all the above. The federal government through the EPA uh, just wants to work to get properties cleaned up and get the environment in, in good condition. So this is uh, a big, a big day for Walker County to get this grant and uh, want to thank our local delegation as well for all their support. 
behind the scenes and the relationships that they have to, to help us get these type of things over the line. So hats off to our local elected officials at the state level as well. So at this time, that's all that I have. Uh, do we have a need to go into an executive session for any item? Yes, I'd like to call for an executive session, discuss personnel and real estate. Okay, we have a need to go into executive session, discuss personnel and real estate. So do we have a motion? Motion. Have a motion by Commissioner Askew. Do we have a second? Second. Have a second by Commissioner Blakemore. All in favor say aye. Aye. All righty. So we will be adjourned until we come back from executive session. Back into the order, it's still uh, Thursday, May the 12th. It is 8.56 p.m. Uh, we just concluded our executive session. There's no further action at this time from the executive session. So do we have a motion to uh, close out our meeting? Motion to adjourn. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Stoltz. Do we have a second? Mm, second. <laughs> uh, we've got a second from uh, Mr. Askew. Seems like there's some more that we need to maybe talk about on I that. Think Think we're okay? <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and adjourn because I think Mr. Stoltz is anxious to get out of here tonight. Yeah. So, All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, sir.